welcome back to the online seminar series, uh, Machine uh, Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. So today we have the pleasure of having uh, a presentation given by uh, two um, academics, very, very good friends. So we have uh, Juan Miguel uh, Morales and uh, Salvador uh, Pineda. So they uh, work uh, at the intersection between uh, analytics, machine learning, and optimization and energy. So I will tell you a little bit about both of them, and then I will give the floor to them. So Juan Miguel uh, Morales, our first speaker, he is uh, an associate professor at the Universidad of Malaga. So he did uh, his uh, undergraduate studies in Malaga, moved to Castilla-La Mancha to the university to do a PhD there in the group of Antonio Conejo. His postdoctoral studies are in uh, Denmark, and then he took uh, several positions at uh, the Denmark uh, Technical University. Um, and finally, he got uh, up to the associate professor position. He received them uh, ERC grant and a starting grant in 2016, and then he moved back to uh, Universidad de Malaga. So it's a nice uh, cycle. Um, Salvador Pineda is an uh, associate professor um, at the Universidad de Malaga, did his uh, undergraduate uh, studies at uh, Universidad de Malaga, moved to Castilla-La Mancha, uh, also to the group of Antonio Conejo, did his PhD there, took some postdoctoral studies in Denmark, and then uh, finally he had an associate professor position uh, at uh, Copenhagen University. And in 2016, he also moved uh, back to Universidad de Malaga. We are very pleased having them here. Um, the talk today is about uncertainty, and uh, we are uh, looking forward to hear what you have to say on this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dolores, for your nice introduction. Uh, I would like to, well, Salva and I would like to thank Dolores and Emilio for giving us the opportunity to participate in this interesting seminar series. As uh, Loli said, the title of our talk is Contentful Decision Making Under Uncertainty. And um, this is a joint work with our PhD students, Miguel Angel Muñoz and Adrián Esteban Pérez. Before uh, starting with the subject matter of this presentation itself, I would like to introduce a little bit ourselves. Both Salva and I are professor at the University of Malaga, as Loli said, uh, said, which is an important university loca located in the south of Spain, in a beautiful city uh, located at the Costa del Sol, Malaga, where it is actually very difficult to see the rain. Uh, they say, and hopefully it will be true, that Malaga is becoming the, the Silicon Valley of the south of Spain. And actually, Google has recently decided to open a cybersecurity center of excellence here in Malaga. Our research group is called OASIS, Optimization and Analytics for Sustainable Energy System. It was established in 2018. It is a small group of young researchers who essentially like optimization statistics and smart energy grids. Um, you have here, in case that you are interested, the link to the website of our group, this oasis.uma.es. Okay, so after this uh, short introduction, let's now talk about the science. The focus of this presentation, I think you can see the pointer, the focus of this presentation is the following conditional stochastic program. The idea is that we want to find a decision X within a feasible set, capital X, such that the expectation of the cost function F is minimized given, and this is what makes the stochastic problem conditional, given that some auxiliary information is available to the decision maker. We take the expectation of the cost function because we see that it is affected by some uncertainty, which we denote with the random vector y. The site information, the auxiliary, the auxiliary information is, is modeled by another random vector set uh, that we believe that has some predictive power on the uncertainty y and that has taken the value set equal to set zero, sub zero. Q here, uh, over which we take the expectation, is the joint distribution of set and y. Whereas this Q sub uh, tilde chi 
is the conditional distribution of y given set equal to set zero. So both formulations of the very of the very same problem are equivalent. Okay, an example of a conditional stochastic problem, which is maybe a bit silly, but I think it illustrates very well what we want to what that problem conveys. Suppose that we are running an ice cream shop and that at 10 a.m. in the morning, we need to decide how much ice cream we are going to make, we are going to produce. This is our decision X. At 10 a.m., however, we don't know the demand for ice cream in the afternoon, but can, we can use some available information, which we, re, we typically refer to as the context. For instance, the context could be the temperature at 10 a.m. in the morning. To make a be, uh, we want to exploit this available information about the temperature to make a better decision. Why? Because we know that there is a strong relationship between the morning temperature, our variable set, the context, and the ice cream in the afternoon, our, our uncertainty, why? We would like to exploit the relationship between the temperature and the demand for ice cream, between the set and the y, to make a better decision, x. So this is just a, a very small example of, what a, a, of a conditional stochastic program. Okay, so we want to solve the conditional stochastic problem that we have seen before. However, we are faced with a fundamental challenge. Neither the true joint distribution that is generating the data, the pairs y and z, um, nor the conditional distribution are known. So the only thing that we have at our disposal is a data sample of size t of the joint distribution, which we denote with this pair set t y t. So what do we do? Here you have some possible you have some possible solution approaches, all of which are based on building surrogate or approximate models because we don't have, as I said before, the true joint distribution of the data or the conditional distribution. The third one is what we call the classical or traditional forecasting approach. We use the data that we have to infer the expectation of y given set equal to set zero. We then plug this expectation into the minimization and we pray for this new surrogate minimization model here to be as close as possible to provide a solution as close as possible to the one we want to actually solve, which is this one, the conditional stochastic program. However, we know that this approach is essentially wrong because it, because it ignores the uncertainty and therefore its impact on the cost function f. As an alternative, we can try to learn a rule mapping the context directly into the decision x in the hope that this mapping rule here is as close as possible to the solution of the original problem. The main problem with this approach is that we need to guarantee that the decision given by this mapping rule is feasible. That is, is always in capital X, the feasible region of the, the smaller X. There is a third approach that is similar to the traditional one. The idea is very similar. Basically, what we want to do is to use the data to compute a mapping rule here from the context to the uncertainty y, possibly very different from the mapping of the expectation of y given set, such that the resulting deterministic problem is indeed closer to the original one and closer in terms of their solutions uh, than if we, if we had just replaced this here with the expectation of y given set equal to set zero. And the last approach that we are going to discuss today in this presentation consists in using the data to get a proxy of the conditional distribution. Unfortunately, it seems that the, the white hat has uh, appears displaced from the, from the Q distribution. So the idea is to, to get a prox an approximation of the conditional distribution of Y given set equal to zero, which we uh, denote with this white hat Q. Uh, sub she tilde, and then solve this surrogate model instead. In all cases, 
the only thing that we have, and I insist, is the sample data uh, from the true join distribution, right? So we need to either create the, rule, the mapping rules that we have seen before, or this approximate conditional distribution from this data sample. All these solution approaches are discussed in these two papers of ours, whose preprints are currently available through archive. And now Salva is going to talk, is going to take the lead, and he's going to talk about the three first approaches that I have uh, uh, briefly summarized uh, before. So Salva, you can take the lead now of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Juanmi. So uh, as Juanmi said, I'm going to, to explain you a little bit more about the parametric uh, approach. Uh, that we discussed in this in this uh, paper, and uh, this is part of the PhD of uh, Miguel Angel Munoz, who is uh, listening. I hope uh, just to correct if I say something silly. Uh, so uh, the three the three approaches uh, we are going to uh, discuss, as Juanmi said, is a forecasting approach, the decision rule approach, and the by level approach. Uh, I, mean, I think you can uh, mute yourself, maybe. Um, so, so the first approach is going to try to learn uh, the relationship between the uncertain parameters uh, y. How do I point here? Do, do you see my mouse? Uh, so we are going to, to learn the relationship between the, the uh, uh, the uncertain parameter y and the contextual information set, but the whole point is that we are going to ignore completely the the objective function and the feasible set of the optimization problem we are solving. In the second approach, we are going to learn the relationship between the optimal decision x star and this contextual information. And in the third one, that is the, actually the one we propose in this paper. We are also going to learn the relationship between Y and Z, as in the first approach. But in this case, we are going to take into account the objective function and the, and the feasible set. So let's see how this is done. Um, yes. Uh, so you can find all this, uh, uh, this work has a lot of uh, notation. And I wanted just to simplify it a little bit. So I'm going to start with actually an application uh, that we use to show how our method uh, works. And this is the problem of a, strate a strategic producer. Uh, we usually apply to uh, energy producer, but you can think of any kind of producer like, I don't know, tomato producer or anything, where you have some uh, inverse amount function that, uh, that is going to relate the prices and the demand and then you have some cost. So basically, you have to decide how much uh, the quantity you are going to produce to maximize profit. And under some uh, typical assumptions, you end up with this kind of uh, quadratic optimization problem with your x being your decision variable and this y being your uncertain parameter. And then your decision variable is bound in between x uh, bar and x uh, upper bar. Uh, so this is uh, quite uh, straightforward to solve if, if you think about it. So if you take the first derivative of the objective function, uh, uh, you can see that the minimum of this quadratic function is uh, at uh, y uh, divided by 2. So if this value is between the, the bounds of my decision variable, then that's the optimal solution. If this, values, if this value is uh, on the left-hand side, then uh, we have the decision is uh, to produce the minimum quantity. If it's uh, to the right, then we have to produce uh, the maximum quantity. Um, as you can see, it's a little bit uh, uh, easy to, to see, but it, it serves us very well to show how, how the method uh, works. Um, yeah, so this is just uh, some, some numbers on this example. So we have just four uh, time periods. This set is our contextual information. You can think of, of it as a temperature, as Fami said before. And this, uh, this Y is actually the uncertain parameter. 
and I just put uh, half of y because if this value is between 0 and 1, that are my, my bounds of my decision, then that's going to be my optimal decision. If this value is above 1, then my decision is just exactly 1 because you cannot produce more than, than 1, just for illustration. Uh, on the left-hand uh, uh, plot, what I presented is the, the uncertain parameter as a function of the contextual information. And on the right-hand uh, plot, you can see the optimal decision as a function also on the uh, contextual information. So you can see that if, the, if this uncertain parameter is above 2, then the optimal decision is just x equal to 1. Otherwise, it's just half of this value. If uh, in this case, so the decisions on this plot on the right are made assuming that you don't have any uncertainty, right? As if you have a crystal ball and you know exactly uh, the values of y. In that case, the income you would get is 21.1, uh, uh, and this is like a, this is like our, our benchmark, right? Because in reality, you don't know this uncertain parameter y, then probably you, due to this uh, lack of information, you are going to also decrease this income. So the whole point of, of my presentation is comparing how much we are losing for each of these uh, three methods. Um, so in the, first, uh, in the first method, yeah, what we're going to do is uh, assume that we have uh, a linear relationship between the um, uh, uncertain parameter and then conceptual information set. And, and this is why these, these methods are parametric, because I have, a, I assume a family of, fu of functions, which in this case is the family of linear functions, they are for, for simplicity and illustration. And then I have two parameters that I need to adjust, and this is A and B. Uh, then, I, how do I estimate A and B? I just, we, we, I guess uh, we all know this, you can use uh, uh, minimum square errors to adjust the parameter of this uh, basic linear uh, regression. And um, once these are adjusted, if a new t time period comes, then you estimate the value of your uncertain parameter y hat using the values of A and B that we have determined in the previous step. And um, about your decision, you just take this, uh, this um, forecast value for the, your certain parameter, and then you solve this optimization problem. This is what we have, it has been done for, for several years, and it, it feels very natural. You, you have some uncertain parameter, you adjust some uh, learning uh, method, and then you forecast, for the new time period, and then you decide. Uh, in this example, uh, we adjust on the left, we have adjust these uh, four data points to, uh, to a, a linear function. Um, and these here are the errors. Um, the root mean square error is uh, 0 0.6. Um, the blue points are the estimations for each of these uh, data points. So, and then uh, for each of these uh, blue points, we have to make a decision. So as you can see now, these two uh, um, uh, points here, which are above uh, two, the predictions uh, go below two, so the, deci the decision is uh, actually changed a little bit. So your decisions on the right-hand side are quite close, more or less, to the optimal one, so the one we got with the crystal ball, uh, that are in black, but not exactly the same. So at the end of the day, we are losing uh, the, the income we get is 95% of that we got in the, in the benchmark. So we are basically losing like 5% of, of income. This is uh, the first more like traditional approach. In the second approach, we say, okay, let's forget about uh, the uncertain parameter Y. And I'm going to just uh, learn the relationship between the optimal decision X star and the con contextual information set. And I'm also going to do that assuming a linear function, just for the sake of, of comparison. 
so what I do to estimate this AMD, well, as you can see, it's still a, a parametric uh, approach. How do I estimate this AMD? I just uh, solve this optimization problem. It's the same as before, but now we minimize the summation over all uh, data points that I have in the, in the training set. But the, the different thing is that now I have imposed that my decision has necessarily to have a linear relationship with the contextual information set. Then once these A and B are adjusted, if a new time period comes, I can just plug the value of the contextual information in this uh, linear function, and then I get my optimal decision. So this is very uh, straightforward because for new time periods, you don't have to solve an optimization problem. You already got your, your you already get your optimal decision by evaluating like a function. Um, for all data, now this is the this is the optimal decisions with uh, as a function of of the contextual information. This is the best uh, linear function that approximates uh, these uh, two things. Um, well, I, I, I guess someone is saying, well, this approximation is not very good because for this data point here on the left, the error is, is quite high. And the problem is that you have to ensure that your decision it stays between uh, 0 and 1 because that's the, that's the bounds on your, on your decision. Uh, so that's why it looks a little bit like not very well approximated. But that, that's the reason. Um, if you do this, the, you also lose some 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 money due to this approximation, and this is uh, it, it's more or less similar to the to the previous one. It's around like nine uh, five uh, percent uh, losses. But there is another important thing about this method, and is that if a new time period comes, for example, at the value of set is here to the right, you may even get like infeasible solutions because because your 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 uh, your optimal decision would be above one, and that's uh, infeasible. So there is an, uh, that, that's another very important drawback of this, of this second method. And now the third method is, is the one we are actually proposing in this, in this work. And uh, our proposal is based on bilevel optimization. So I'm not sure if everybody is uh, familiar with uh, bilevel optimization, but in case you're not, I have uh, here like a very uh, simple example to illustrate what bi-level optimization is about. So it's about two friends, John and Peter, and they go every week to the, to the movies. That was before uh, COVID, I guess. And so the, the way they have to decide uh, the movie they are going to watch every week is uh, first, John decides uh, the movie theater, and then, Peter decides uh, the movie within that uh, movie theater that John has uh, chosen. So that's, that's kind of the game they have. So first, John decides the theater, and then uh, Peter the movie. Uh, so they have their preferences, of course. John prefers uh, action movies over terror movies. Um, he doesn't like very much romantic movies. Um, Peter is kind of the other way around. So uh, his favorites are romantic uh, movies, and uh, he doesn't like action movies uh, very much. Um, so given this, uh, this game and this, uh, th there are two uh, theaters available. Theater 1 is Spiderman, Notting Hill, and Theater B is The Exorcist and, and The Matrix. Um, so maybe you can think about five seconds the, the, the theater that uh, John would choose considering like the, his uh, preferences. So it's, it's, it's not that difficult to see, I guess, that, so let, let's imagine that, uh, that uh, John chooses uh, theater A, then Peter is going to come and choose uh, Notting Hill that is a romantic movie. And then John is, John is going to be a little bit pissed off because that's the movie he doesn't like at all. So the, the, the right answer is that uh, John is going to choose uh, theater B because there is no romantic movie 
uh, in this theater, and then at least he's going to see like a the terror movies, right? So this is uh, I don't know if if I succeed to show that this is like a a, a sequential game. So first John decides something, and then Peter decides another thing. So there is a sequence of decisions, and then this is non-cooperative because uh, each of them they have their own preferences about movies. Um, so somehow what John is is doing is anticipating what Peter is going to do to make his own decision. And this is more or less what uh, bi-level programming is, is about. Uh, in a mathematical notation, this is how bi-level uh, programs uh, are formulated, where you have basically one optimization problem inside another optimization problem. So this is the upper level and the lower level. And, and the key thing here is that the, the upper level problem is somehow anticipating what is going to happen in the in the second level, the same as with uh, John and Peter. Uh, so going back to, to the method we propose to make decisions, we are going to assume as well a linear relationship as, as in the first uh, method between the uncertain parameter y and our contextual information set. Um, but now a and b are not going to be determined using uh, minimum square error regression but we are going to uh, compute them solving this uh, bi-level optimization problem. So what we are doing here is deciding A and B, anticipating that these two parameters are going to use in an optimization problem with a given objective function and a given uh, feasible region, right? So while in the mean square errors, you are just hoping to minimize the, the forecast error, here you are just uh, taking into account the, the optimization problem you are actually solving. Uh, once this is, uh, these two parameters are chosen, if a new time period comes, then you plug the contextual information in, and then you solve the same optimization problem as before. So this looks, uh, well, uh, the next question is, okay, so how do we solve this uh, uh, bi-level problem. Uh, under some assumption, convexity assumption of the lower level, what most people do is just to uh, take, uh, replace the lower level by the KKT optimality conditions, and then you get just a single level optimization problem that it's a little bit difficult to solve because it's non-linear, because you have products of uh, dual variables and primal variables. It also doesn't satisfy some constraint qualifications, so it's not uh, that easy to solve, but there are some strategies. This is very well known in the literature. One of them is to replace the complementarity uh, conditions using binary variables and large enough constants. This solves a little bit the problem, but partially, because you need one binary variable per data point, so you have a lot of data, you are, being, are going to be in trouble, and also, it adjusting these big ends is not is not an easy task so another another alternative is to the using the regularized uh, regularization method that instead of imposing that the product of dual variable or constraint has to be equal to zero we relax it a little bit with a parameter epsilon that is iteratively reduced and um, this is quite fast and it works uh, relatively well to solve uh, linear bi-level optimization problems. So this is uh, the solution. So as you can see here at the top, we have also a linear relationship between Y and Z, but now it's a little bit funny because here it, with the point uh, at, at the right, you have a huge, uh, a huge error. Indeed, the, the root mean square error is now 0 0.74. If you remember from in the, in the first case, it was, it was uh, equal to 0 0.6 or something like that. So we have increased our, our error, right? But now, if you will look at the decisions induced by these three uh, blue points, we get that they are almost uh, equal to those uh, provided in the, in the benchmark. So actually, for these three points here, they are exactly the same. That's why you only see the blue one. And here in the right, we have a, a small error in the decision. 
and and the the income losses that we have in this case is only 0.1 percent so we are losing around five five percent in the other two cases and only 0.1 in in this case in the in the method we propose so next question is well you can always find an illustrative example where things uh, work as, as you want them to work but uh, oh sorry this is just a small uh, comparison of the of the illustrative example this is what i was saying before so we see an increase in the root mean square error of the of the uncertain parameter but the the income is uh, significantly improved so we have also tried in a more realistic uh, case study to do that, we use uh, uh, data from the Iberian electricity market to approximate the inverse demand functions. So we are uh, we apply it to uh, uh, electricity producers. Uh, we use as uh, contextual information we use uh, wind and solar power forecast, and we did it for three different generation technologies: uh, base uh, technology that basically means it's always on, like nuclear, medium like uh, carbon and peak so this is only on when you have very high demand like uh, gas technology and to to compute the average result we run it in different uh, data sets of uh, 200 hours and we use 160 for training and 40 uh, as the test sets and this is uh, the results we got so the first interesting thing is that in the in the if you have a base unit like a, a nuclear uh, unit uh, uncertainty about uh, the market is not very important because basically you're going to be always uh, on and running so that's why the three methods provide the very similar results however this is not the case for the medium and the peak so depending on the on the market conditions you will be maybe running up to the max, your maximum production, or you'll be like midway, or you'll be not, not producing at all. So this uncertainty has a lot of impact. And, and this is a, these numbers here are the relative incomes. So you can see, as for example, for the medium uh, unit, we got a 3% uh, higher profit. And for the case of the peak unit, we got almost 20% uh, uh, more uh, profit and also in the last row I included uh, if you remember in the in the second uh, approach in the decision rule approach where you just relate the optimal decisions with the contextual information to have the risk that your decision is infeasible and that, that actually happened in a non negligible number of cases in, in our case study so you have to be careful with this uh, type of approach um, as a summary of the uh, uh, parametric approach I talked to you about, we have the forecasting approach, learning the relationship between Y and Z. It, th this is interesting because you have a, lot of, a wide uh, variety of methods. We just use linear regression, but you have like random forest, decision tree, etc. The problem is that your decisions are going to be uh, suboptimal because you're basically ignoring the optimization problem you are you will have to solve then you in the second approach you, we found the relationship between optimal decision and contextual information the the, the good point is that uh, you can decide uh, very quickly the decision and but the problem is that the that decision can be infeasible and then in the in the pro, uh, approach we propose the by level approach we are learning the relationship between Y and Z, but taking into account the optimization problem, and this is going to provide much better decision. The problem is that uh, you have to solve the bilevel problem. So in, in our case, that was a quadratic uh, problem with uh, linear regression. It is not that hard, but further uh, research is required to, to apply this method to, to, other, to other problems. So, I think I'm going to stop here and pass it uh, to Juanmi, who is going to talk to you a little bit more about uh, the non-parametric approach. Okay, thank you, Salva. So, recall that the last solution approach that uh, we were going to discuss in this presentation is the one that I have highlighted here in red, and it's based on getting a proxy 
of the conditional distribution of the uncertainty given the context from the available data sample. I guess that you will all agree with me if I say that in principle, the empirical joint distribution of the data is the best proxy we can have of the true joint distribution that generates the data, okay? So the problem here is that we need a proxy of the conditional distribution, not a proxy of the joint distribution. And this is where all the, all the challenge is going to, to, to rest on. The most straightforward way to get such a proxy is then to somehow fabricate it from the joint empirical distribution of the data that we have uh, in, this, uh, in this figure, right? The, the blue points represent the, uh, the true, the, um, sorry, the joint empirical distribution of the, de of the data. So this is what we're going to do here. We have a didact distribution supported on each of the blue points, which we somehow, and this, is, and this somehow is key, we're going to weight as a function of the context with this W here to build this conditional empirical distribution that we're going to use as a proxy of, uh, of the true one. Then we can plug this empirical conditional distribution into the minimization problem that we have seen before and get the following surrogate model. This sur surrogate model here, okay? Uh, this is actually what they propose in this recent paper that I have uh, indicated here by Versima and Kalus. One of the advantages of the clear advantages of this approach is that the resultant surrogate model is tractable in the sense that the expectation only needs a T evaluation of the cons function for a given decision X. But the problem is how do we go from the joint empirical distribution of the data to the conditional empirical one? And this is the crux of the matter because this question somehow is telling us that in fact there are potentially many ways to do so. There are there is there is ambiguity about how to construct the conditional empirical distribution from the joint data. For example, we can use k nearest neighbors, and when we wonder which value of k we need to use, or we can use Nadaraja Watson kernel regression, and then we we need to wonder which kernel kernel, uh, kernel uh, we are going to use, etc. Here I have uh, we have an example when we use two nearest neighbors. Basically, we take the data points, the data points that are closest to the context, and these two data points constitute the proxy of the conditional distribution we are looking for. Based on this proxy of the conditional distribution, we can solve this deterministic minimization problem. Of course, this doesn't work well because we have uh, we, um, because when we uh, this doesn't I mean this previous method here does not work well because especially when we have a small sample size because the surrogate model is going to be very optimistic and will suffer from what we call the curse of the optimizer. Essentially, and um, I insist this is be, this is so because there are many ways to build the conditional empirical distribution. For this reason, in another recent paper by Versima and McCorn and Stewart, they propose to minimize over the worst case conditional empirical distribution that may result from moving the data points within a certain distance from the original locations given by the local predictive methods. In this case, given by the two nearest neighbor. This epsilon t is precisely the distance that we can move these two points apart. In fact, they go a little bit farther and consider the worst case distribution within a Bastertian bulb of radius rho that, uh, rho that is centered on the conditional empirical distribution given by the local predictive method. Okay, so they consider all the probability distributions that are uh, within a distance rho uh, from the conditional empirical distribution that we have built using the two nearest neighbor, for example, uh, method that we have that I have uh, that I have put an, as an example before. 
for those of you who are not very familiar with the Bacertian distance, let me just say that it is a metric to measure how different two distributions are, and that can be actually expressed itself as a minimization problem, what we call an optimal mass transportation problem. However, the truth, the truth is that uh, Bersima et al. do not fix the key problem, which is that there are many possible conditional empirical distributions we can build from the joint data sample. So what we propose instead is to use an ambiguous center for the Vassertian bowl. This ambiguous center here is given by the one minus alpha three means of the joint empirical distribution of the data. And it is made up of all distributions supported in at most T points, each with a maximum weight given by one divided by T uh, multiplied by alpha. This way, we don't have to stick to a particular condi empirical condition and distribution, but we are considering all possible ones at once. This is very interesting, actually, because this way we can protect our decision against the inference process made by the local predictive method. For example, think of the two nearest neighbor. It could be that the third neighbor is almost as close to the context as the second one, but its impact on the cost function is by far more harmful in terms of the cost. OK. In the end, we need to solve this distributional robust optimization problem, where this constraint that you can see here, this constraint to be, is a partial mass transportation problem, an alpha of the trimming set, this alpha t, is the minimum amount of data points from the joint empirical distribution that must participate in the construction of the conditional empirical distribution. This row here is the budget, the degree of uh, the transportation budget, the degree of robustness. The higher the value of row, the, the, the more conservative our decision will be. OK, in this slide, I'm just summarizing very quickly the good things about our approach. First of all, it is as tractable as the other approaches that are based on distribution, distribution and robust optimization. And we can also prove that it features high performance guarantees under mild assumptions. Performance guarantees in terms of uh, convergence, um, um, consistency, and finite sample guarantees. Here, it is an example to illustrate the different methods for approximating, approximating the conditional distribution we have seen. There are more examples in the paper. This, is, this, goes, uh, this deals with the popular single eaten news vendor problem, where the uncertainty, why, represents the demand for a product. In our case, it could be, for example, demand for ice cream. And the contest may represent the outside temperature for the, uh, for the ice cream example. We have H as the unit holding cost, in case we need to store some of the ice cream that we have not sold. And the back order unit cost represented the cost of not, satisfi not, of not satisfying the demand. This is the conditional stochastic problem we decided to solve, which is known to be equivalent to a conditional quantile regression problem. These are the methods, the three methods by proposed by Bersimas et al. Uh, that I have just talked about before. Our method is uh, denoted as DRO trim from trimming sets. OK, so let's see some results qu um, quickly. OK, here on the left plot, on the left plot, we represent the true joint distribution together with the true conditional distribution given by the context here. On the right plot, we represent the optimal solution given by the different methods as a function of the sample size t. Uh, these optimal solutions depends on the data sample, and therefore, we provide its expectation, which are the, the solid lines, OK, and the 15 and 85 percentiles. The dotted line, the dotted line that you can see here, uh, represents the ideal solution. That is the, the solution we would get with if we had full information, if we, if we solved the, the original conditional stochastic program. Uh, just to say that our method, as you can see, our method not only provides solutions very close to the actual one, 
but also it's very important to see the variance of these solutions compared to the other methods. Okay, here on the right floor, we represent the actual expected cost that we achieve when we when the when the optimal solutions given by the different methods are implemented. Again, the dotted line here uh, represents the expected cost with full information. Uh, observe how our method substantially performs the other ones in expectation, but also and very importantly in terms of variance of the actual cost that we get for implementing the decision that it delivers. Lastly, here on the left plot, we represent what we call the auto-sample disappointment or regret. The auto-sample disappointment is basically defined as the difference between uh, the actual cost of a decision and the cost estimated by the method from which we got that decision. Meaning that a positive re regret is a bad surprise, while negative values mean a good surprise. Here, just to highlight that all the methods that are based on distribution in robust optimization, our method DREO trim, the KNN robust method proposed by Versimas, and the KN DREO method proposed also by Versimas and all, and all, they all are able to uh, to keep the auto sample disappointment negative, that is to to produce good surprises when we implement the decisions. But in our case, our method not only is able to to keep the regret negative, but also to provide better actual uh, better performance in terms of actual cost actual expected cost okay so just to finish i think these are the conclusions of this last approach we have built a uh, distribution robust, robust optimization pro, uh, approach based on optimal transport to solve the conditional stochastic optimization problem we prove that tractability is preserved there is no more uh, tractability issues that uh, that those we have with the classical DR, D, uh, DRO methods. We also have performance guarantees in terms of uh, we are able to to ensure that uh, when the sample size is large enough, we are going to get the optimal uh, the optimal decision with full information and the optimal cost with full information under my uh, my assumptions. And also, we can see that uh, the method has significant improvements over alternative approaches as well, presented in the literature. So I think that's all. Uh, these are the references that we have used. Um, thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, both Salva and I we are, will be very willing to, to, to reply to them. Thank you, uh, Juan Miguel, and thank you, Salvador. Um, as usual, we, we open the floor for questions and then yeah, you can uh, yeah, uh, unmute um, if you don't mind, put your camera on. Uh, Vladimir, would you, would you like to um, pose your questions? <coughs> oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Yes. Ah, okay. Okay, so let me just repeat uh, what I just wrote. Uh, thanks for the talk; it was very inspiring. And um, I was I, I'm very curious about your level frameworks that you presented in the first part of the talk. And I'm curious uh, if uh, you could comment on the uh, statistical consistency of the predictions uh, made by bi-level framework. So if would, you would use it like many many times, would the predictions of the bi-level problem Converge to the expected value of the uncertain uh, parameter, uh, or you actually produce some biases towards uh, uh, cost optimal decisions, right? And my second question is uh, about the same bi-level framework, but I also think it can uh, uh, apply to uh, this non-parametric approach for the second part of the talk. Uh, can you deal with the cases when the uncertainty is contained in the feasible region of the problem? Thank you. Uh, Salva, do you want to try to answer, or should I should I yeah, answer? Or? So the, the second one, uh, we haven't really tried with uh, with uh, optimization problems in which the uncertainty affect the feasible region. Um, 
so we were uh, we we did some some experiments and things started to to get uh, a bit nasty. And then we decided to first stay with the with the with uncertainty only affecting the 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 objective function. So this is one of the on the, of the assumptions we make in the in the preprint. And with regarding the first one, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, maybe I can I can answer that, yeah. um, uh, Vladimir. Um, no, there will be a bias because here, when our purpose, we don't want a method that converges to the expectation of y given z given the context. We are not interested in that. Here, a statistical consistency is measured in, in other terms. Here, we measure statistical consist consistency, asking the uh, answering the question whether our bilevel approach is going to give the best possible decision uh, with full information, if we have full information. So we say that our method will be consistent if uh, when we have a large sample size, um, the decision that we make with our method will be the same as the one we would make with the full information problem. So we don't want consistency. We don't want to retrieve the actual expectation of why given the, the context. I don't know if this answer. So, so we will have a bias because may, uh, does, maybe, the, yeah. Tell me. Does, does it does it mean that uh, uh, this prediction that your bilevel model um, does is good for a decision maker, but it doesn't? It's not good for a general public. Exactly. It's, okay. it's, it's not general. It's, it's not good for the optimization problem, which is the first the the minimization of the square error. Is not good for that one. Is good for the optimization problem, which is uh, having the, the the highest benefit possible in the market. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we have a hand from Itamar. Uh, would you like to? Yeah, I was wondering. I was wondering how a flexible and clever consumer can enjoy your beautiful analysis to take advantage uh, the, the consume what do you mean well you you work in a project about that focused about flexible consumers so the question is now that the analysis is more or less in good uh, shape suppose i am a flexible consumer and I read your analysis, how can I take advantage of it to save money or to be well, more uh, uh, um, uh, Yeah, the, the question more is, is like the, the it, I mean, I can help you as far as you have a uh, um, some uncertain information affecting your decisions one way or another and B, some con contextual information that uh, it may help you to reduce uncertainty. Uh, if you have these two things, then you could apply, I mean, you can always formulate the, the bi-level uh, bi approach we propose. However, depending on, on how your objective function looks like and how your feasible region looks like, solving this uh, bi-level problem may be more challenging than what we show here, which is a more stylized uh, application. So are there some easy way to, to work out examples to, to optimize it from the point of view of the flexible consumer? Well, I mean, if, if, you, if you formulate your, the, the, your consumer problem as a quadratic uh, optimization problem, then you, should just, you can just use it without anything else. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Good presentation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And uh, uh, Aquilas, uh, you, you pose a question in the chat. Uh, would you like to uh, unmute and? <coughs> yeah. Like Hi. To... Yeah. Can Thank you hear you me? So much. Oh, okay. Yes, we can hear you very well. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Well, thanks for the presentation. Uh, for the first method with the bi-level uh, formulation. Uh, it, uh, well, I guess the, the standard approach is to do a uh, well, prediction and then optimizing the, 
the problem. Uh, have you considered also, I mean, in, in your uh, comparisons, uh, the case when you use probabilistic predictions, so you have the conditional distribution and then you optimize to find the, the solution in comparison to your bi-level, uh, which I assume is deterministic approach? Uh, no, we, we haven't tried that. And, and the reason is that uh, maybe we didn't, uh, I don't know if I can go to slide that one. Uh, the, the, the reason is that what, uh, what the, so, so the final point is that you can solve the, your optimization problem for a new period, like in a fast, let's say, and a quick manner. So you, so you don't want, of course, you can go to more traditional approaches where you have like a, a lot of scenarios or even a, 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 a distribution itself. But we wanted to, to, to solve it and to make decision in a, in a, in a fast way. I don't know if Wami wants to add, to add something to that. Uh, oh, okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Aquiles. Uh, um, is there any other question? So, David, um, yeah, if you could unmute, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, uh, hi, Salva and Juanmi. Thank you for your presentation, a uh, very nice presentation. So my, my question here is, uh, is uh, well, I'm trying to understand in your contextual by level uh, problem. So basically you are embedding this forecast fitting and this could end up in some overestimation or underestimation of some particular key parameter of your optimization problem. Like for example, in the news vendor problem, uh, you can overestimate or underestimate the demand of the item. And basically, I think for me, it's clear, like depending on the cost of, for this particular problem of the news vendor, if you are, if, if your cost of overstocking or understocking are different, so you can actually understand like it's better to underestimate or overestimate. But all of this is related with the risk of your forecast. How this is connected for, with the approaches that are embedding into the objective function some risk measurement related with these data points? Uh, first of first of observation, yeah. So so you are uh, uh, aware of this. Um, using this approach in the in 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 case where your uh, objective function is linear, it's a little bit uh, trickier because uh, there is an incentive of the uh, upper upper level problem to find multiple solutions in the lower level problem and then you get kind of nothing. So you should, uh, you should solve your bi-level problem considering the pessimistic solution. That's not always uh, um, an easy uh, question. So that's, uh, that's uh, the first thing. And, and the second one, you said if, if how this compared to, the, to, the, to considering risk um, uh, in the objective function, I guess. No, I, I, I'm trying to get some intuition of, because you have a, a linear regression as yeah. a, your, your forecast tool, and basically you estimate parameters of your linear regression. And this, is, this will try to overestimate or underestimate demand in the case that your yeah. y so, is so, demand. Yeah, so, yeah. so, 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 yeah, so if, if, if you are depending on your, the asymmetry of, of, of your on your cost in the in the news vendor problem, then this this is going to capture that. So if if you have if for example underestimating your demand has no cost, then you are going to be biased to make a prediction in the in the other direction. If that's what you're asking. Yes. So uh, that's right. So the output will be some. Uh, forecast will be underestimating or overestimating depending yeah, on the be, cost. It would, be, it would be like a quantile. Yeah. In the case of the news vendor problem that you have, that you are mentioning, 
the idea is the is that uh, you don't want to i mean your linear regression function if we train it through the bilevel model is going to to converge to the quantile regression because the news vendor problem i mean uh, i put it here but it's difficult to go to the end i don't know how to i mean the in the news vendor problem basically what you're trying to do is to estimate to estimate a quantile this quantile is based on the b and h which are the asymmetry of the cost so the by level the by level problem will give you a linear function that is trying to capture that quantile specifically while the traditional forecasting approach is trying to capture the expectation and the expectation we know that is not the best the best is not the the, the good solution for the news burner problem because the good solution for the news burner problem is a specific quantile of your probability distribution mm -hmm. i don't know if yeah, they... yeah okay no, yes uh, but this uh, traditional forecast based tool is uh, risk neutral yes um, yeah so and um, so yeah, my uh, point was here is just if there is some connection of some there, 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 there is yeah there is and this is a, it's a I, I would say it's a it's a different framework you could also as aquila said you could also have maybe you can use the statistics you estimate a proxy as i said in my in the last part of the presentation you estimate a proxy of the conditional distribution what we have always called scenarios based on a probabilistic model or whatever or using knn whatever and then you solve a stochastic problem with some condition, with some risk measure. Okay, that's another approach. And actually that approach is essentially, somehow uh, you are estimating the conditional distribution that, we, that you are gonna have. If you have more risk, then this conditional distribution is, will be placed on the, on the worst scenarios. Will, will have will will give more weight to the worst case scenarios, right? So it's a different approach. It's a here the idea of the bilevel approach is uh, having something more clever than the traditional regression, for example, the traditional for uh, the traditional point forecast. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much for the questions. I think we are um, going to um, leave it here for the sake of um, being on time. So uh, we we would all like to um, uh, uh, give a round of applause to um, Salva and Juan Miguel. And um, for the rest of the people, remember that we are taking a two weeks break, Easter break, and we will be back uh, in uh, April with the next round of um, presentations. Thank you very much for your attentions and see you back in uh, April. Thank you. Thank you.